God of War. What a game, right? If you're anything like me, you've devoured it multiple times. Yet, there's some secret things that the game doesn't tell you about its Norse world, the realms, and how it all came to be. I'm keeping this introduction super short as friends. We have a lot to get through, so let me just issue a spoiler warning for the entire game right now. I will be talking about the plot, characters, and a bunch of other things in the nine realms in this video. So if you haven't played God of War, stop watching now, go buy it and play it. Even if you don't watch this video afterwards, because it's an absolutely stunning game and one of the best games to have ever been made, period. Fight me. Intro over, time to get started. Here's 28 things you didn't know about God of War, even if you played the game. Let's kick off with one of the most bewitching levels in God of War, Alfheim. A realm at war, Kratos and Atreus have to navigate the conflict between the enigmatic light elves and the disciplined dark elves as they head towards the light of Alfheim, which powers the Bifrost, allowing gods, giants and, more importantly, Kratos and Atreus to journey between realms. The light of Alfheim is the only thing lighting the level, which is why, during your time in the elves' realm, all the grand, large trees are twisted as they strain to grow closer to the light. A lot of the structures, whether they be temples, a marketplace, or the ruins of something we can't even fathom, were built by giants, otherwise known as Jotun. These folks were characterised as being opportunistic builders, meaning they built where a lot of work was already done for them. So, you'll find Jotun buildings built into the sides of mountains, or wherever there was a massive stone just sitting in the middle of the landscape, ready for them to carve and haul and chip away at to create a brand new dwelling. God of War's initial pitch was grounded in mythological realism. The key feeling the Sony Santa Monica team wanted to convey was that the player should feel they were exploring a world where they could stumble upon the gods at any time. Like seeing them in the form of a shadow in the woods running past you, or through other manifestations that were smaller in scale in comparison to the gargantuan, ostentatious depictions of the Greek gods in previous God of War games. From the very beginning, the tale of Kratos and Atreus was supposed to be Ultra minimal. Atreus to me. Okay, I'm coming. No ornate designs, nothing that took you out of the realism that was originally the plan. This stretched as far as the team not even wanting any metal on the characters at all. Presumably just having them decked out in furs and leather. As development progressed, the ultra minimalist aesthetic was softened, as you can see in something as small as Kratos's metal Leviathan holder. Helheim was the realm that took the longest to nail. Corey Barlog, God of War's creative director, wanted it to feel, quote unquote, colder than cold. But getting there was tricky as the designs and architecture for the realm just didn't feel right. It was only after the team looked at all their concept art that they realised that they liked the ones that focused on Helheim's fractured structures and their harsh angles. And it was artist Anis Naim that solidified these elements that we got and gave us the eerie Helheim Kratos visits. Atreus's look was going to point a lot more to the sickness he suffered throughout his life. Some designs had bits of his hair falling out from the stress put on his body, which was eventually replaced by his shaved mohawk-like haircut. Mind you, Look closely at him and you'll see his face is covered in spidery scars, which are the reminders of his long bouts of illness during his childhood. Around his neck, Atreus wears a yellow scarf, which used to belong to his mother, Faye. If you compare her burial shroud to the scarf, you'll see that they're made of very similar material, which is morbid, but strangely touching too. Early on, Kratos was going to meet other NPCs and characters on his journey to the mountain with Atreus. 
Among them were going to be humans, called nomads, and travelers, warriors who voyage across the land to test their metal and hone their combat skills, both magical and melee. Both of these groups were going to be searching for a way to Jotunheim too, as the realm of the gods was meant to be one of endless bounty, strewn with golden fields stretching as far as the eye could see. In the end, the nomads were scrapped entirely, and travellers were turned into one of the most powerful enemies Kratos could attempt to bury his axe in. We never find out whether the travellers, aside from their thirst for combat, are still hunting for a route to Jotunheim. When you think of dragons, you probably think of something very large, scaled, with wings, and that broadly looks like this. Not so in God of War. Dragons were designed to look nothing like traditional Western interpretations of dragons, with some resembling salamanders, others basking sharks, and others still looking like gliding seahorse-esque creatures. Speaking of the nomads, I'm not quite sure what happened to them. They're mentioned in the art of God of War, with their presence in the game meant to be a more grounded and realistic portrayal of survival in Kratos' world as they searched for Jotunheim. They may have been repurposed into these Reavers, who are the only human enemies we've run into during the entire game, and do kind of match the Nomad's design. This fight is mine alone. Draugr are God of War's bread and butter in terms of enemies. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that they're all messed up because of the war wounds they suffered in life. But that's not why they look so broken. The Draugr are fractured like this because their body can't cope with being unnaturally reborn over and over again, as they're cursed to do. The only thing holding the Draugr together is their tortured soul, which is why their bodies look like a puzzle that's been forced together all wrong. Going back to Alfheim, the fantastical look was inspired by practical 80s pre-digital colour film aesthetics of movies like The Dark Crystal, The Neverending Story and Labyrinth. And then, more obviously, mythical realism and Norse mythology. The ringed temple in Alfheim that houses the light of Alfheim was going to have a very literal life and death connotations. Bear this in mind next time you're rowing through the realm's tranquil waters because yes, you should be replaying God of War. Alfheim was going to be a waiting room for life itself. Souls of living beings were going to coalesce in the lake around the ringed temple and then use the temple as a bridge to the other realms where they'd arrive and be born into humanity as babies. This factors into the Dark Elf versus Light Elf conflict in a kind of dark way. It was envisaged that when the temple was controlled by Dark Elves, more stillbirths would occur as the souls couldn't leave the lake to be born, as this version of Dark Elves fed off the Light of Alfheim. I have no idea what the Light Elves use the Light of Alfheim for, or whether they feed off it too, but either way, Alfheim was at one time envisaged to have serious connotations for other realms. At first, the Light Elves might look quite different from the Dark Elves, with their long pale robes and lack of wings, but look closely and you can definitely tell they're not so different after all. They were designed to have the same body markings as their dark brethren, and they've disguised their horns to make them look like headpieces by wrapping them in fabric. Most of the blood was spilt by dark elves in Alfheim, according to the limited amount we saw, but it's the light elves who really give me the creeps. Like Kratos says, we shouldn't make assumptions about either side, and I bet that the light elves aren't all they seem. When you enter the Lake of the Nine, you can't help but be drawn to the temple with the giant statue of Tyr atop of it. I mean, it is part of the game that you have to go towards it, but you get my point. Whereas we gradually learn that Tyr befriended cultures and beings from all around the globe, and he generally comes across as peaceful and decent, Tyr was intended to be an ostentatious egomaniac, similar to Odin. Balrog wanted his temple, therefore, to be extravagant, flashy and majestic to reflect this. But as development progressed and Tyr's character mellowed, his temple became the Temple of the Lake of the Nine instead, and your route to the other realms. Leota. 
The Revenant is an eerie, disturbing wielder of magic with her long neck, scraggly hair and oh god would you just stay still? Anyway, one scrapped concept for the Revenant had her magic not coming from her staff at all. Instead, it emanated from a drum she would beat to unleash her cursed seaver. Iceland's sulphur pits inspired the opening level where you hunt with a trace. Before you can enter the mountain, first you have to find a way past the thick, dark smoke that blocks the entrance. Well, the While it just looks like normalish but still definitely best avoided smoke in the game, alternate designs included it clinging to the player with ghostly hands. No thank you. The piles of dead bodies in the mountain that you find were warriors who were trying to make it to Jotunheim, the fabled realm of plenty of the giants that I mentioned earlier. Seeing Baldur ride his very own dragon, named Dagsetter, by the way, and consequently fighting him on top of it might make you think that all the gods have their own dragons. But that's not so. It's incredibly rare and saying it's difficult is an understatement to tame a dragon, meaning that this was a subtle way to demonstrate Baldur's strength and power to the player, as he's one of the few gods who can actually ride a dragon. The Holdra brothers, Sindri and Brock, don't look that similar, but that wasn't always the case. Due to his intense blacksmithing work with raw magical ores and a ton of silver, Brock's skin gradually changed colour to the bluish grey it is in God of War, as the fumes from the metalwork took effect on his body. Let's see the damage! While we're on the subject of skin, the Dark Elf King's skin, try saying that three times fast, has markings that evoke the natural patterns you'll see on the wings of moths and butterflies. Considering the Dark Elves insect-like design, that makes complete sense and, honestly, to me, the Dark Elves are a refreshing interpretation of Elves and hands down, my favourite that I've seen in goddamn ages. It beats making them long-eared snobby humans. But before I get even more distracted, the team at Sony Santa Monica wanted the Dark Elf King to look like he had sprung from the natural world, in contrast to the pristine, coldly refined aesthetics of the Light Elves. Hence, his horns resembling the branches of a tree, and his armour looking like metal bark. When you're not busy getting impaled by metal wings or stood on, look closely at the masks of each of the Valkyries. They're each based on an animal, eagle, vulture, raven, deer, owl, bear, boar and ram. The Valkyrie Queen reigns above them all and is designed after a goddamn dragon, complete with blood-stained maw. Yes. Just yes. <laughs> Tyr's temple is made of polished volcano rock. The Norse gods aren't like their Greek brethren. I mean, sure, they're selfish, tyrannical egomaniacs who terrorise the realms for their own ends and kill without concern for anyone else, but their manner of dressing is a far cry from the pristine, ornate Greek pantheon. From the very beginning, their clothing and design was intentionally made unrefined and more brutal than their Greek gods. You can see the battles they fought and fights they've got into through their grimy, often battered outfits and tattoos. Just take a look at Magni and Modi, as even the most decorative parts of their outfits are covered in dirt and grime, as if they can't even be bothered to clean them. These nightmares are a cruel parody of Odin's lost eye, which he gouged out in return for knowledge. Mammoths and trolls have something in common. Tusks. As well as this giving both of them a helpful extra bit of bone to smack enemies with, it also shows that trolls have been around since mammoths walked the earth. These ancient, combat-loving beings have a strange symbiotic relationship with the rune markers they carry around and attack Kratos with too, with the markers being far from just blunt force weapons. The trolls' runic magic comes from these markers. How they became dependent upon each other and where the markers even came from, I have no idea. And seeing as the troll tribes were annihilated and the survivors scattered in the distant past by the Aesir, and that Kratos killed a bunch of the remaining trolls during God of War, 
Chances are that we might never know. Climbing to the top of the mountain to find Mimir imprisoned by the gate to Jotunheim is one hell of a trek. You've got to make it through feet of snow and a rocky path. But at the top, bizarrely, there's greenery. Senior concept artist Mark Kastanen came up with this idea, imagining that the giants spilled seeds that burst into life at top of the mountain before they fled to Jotunheim. And that's 28 things you didn't know about God of War, even if you played the game. If you enjoyed the video, thanks very much, and don't forget to like and subscribe to Eurogamer for more videos about video games, as we have a new one out every single day. You can also follow us on Instagram at Team Eurogamer, where you'll get daily updates about videos we have coming out, when we're doing live streams and glimpses behind the scenes. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go. So remember to stay hydrated, folks, and I'll see you next time.